Good evening, councillors and staff. Joining me here in the council chamber and also a warm welcome to those streaming at home and what a visual delight we have for you sitting here in the council chamber this evening with a couple of Christmas decorated councillors ready to go and, and hopefully you've made it home through uh, some very tense times at the border crossing today for another significant moment in history. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which we are meeting and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to those from other communities who are here with us today uh, for they hold the memories, the tradition and the culture of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, item three, apologies and requests for leave of absence. Are there any? No. Um, item four, declaration under acts, regulations, codes or local laws. CEO, are there any? No, thank you. Uh, declaration item five by councillors of any conflicts of interest. Thank you, councillors. Uh, item of which there are none. Item six, confirmation of minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, now item six, uh, these are for the 30th of November to be confirmed. Uh, do I have a mover that these minutes are correct? Thank you, councillor Bennett. And a seconder. Thank you, councillor Mildren. Does anybody wish to speak against the motion? Carried unanimously, thank you very much. Item seven is our delegates' reports, of which there are none. Uh, into item eight, and item 8.1, which is the request to be heard in response to notice of intention to grant an option to purchase land and to sell land. Uh, councillors, this is on page one of the agenda, uh, and that includes the uh, officer recommendation there. Before I ask for a motion on this, though, I will invite the submitter who joins us here also in the room, Mr. Michael Gable, to come forward to the council table there in front of me. Thank you, Michael. And um, a copy of your submission has been provided to all of us councillors. It's also included in the agenda papers. Uh, we do ask, obviously, you're quite familiar with this process that you observe the certain protocols uh, for this presentation. We'll give you 15 minutes, um, as you know, as set out. And uh, I now invite you to speak in support of your written submission, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, councillors, for providing this opportunity for me. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge some individuals that would, would have been here if it hadn't have been for the COVID restrictions in support of my submission. But um, just to be clear, this submission is not about the land that was in the public notice that was to um, that's being optioned that is west of Lady Franklin Road. So this submission is specifically to the land that's um, being proposed to be optioned that's in the city of Wodonga within the main logic precinct, just for clarity. So for those that don't know me, my name is Michael Goebel and I have extensive knowledge and background in logic and Wodonga through my history as the former Director of Investment Attraction from the period of Logic's early inception back in 2004 through to 2011. I've also had involvement as a consultant assisting council in attracting, negotiating and structuring commercial negotiations of major sales at Logic. These included Border Express, Cope Sensitive Freight, TAFE, BP Service Centre, SCT and the development outside of Logic being the NVLX sale yards, as well as XLAM. My engagement has also extended to assisting council with other negotiations, including the Hewen Hill, Quest, Mans Development, and Woolworths Wodonga Place here in the CBD. In addition to my long association with Logic, I also have 12 years experience in financial markets, a Bachelor of Science with an Accounting and Finance major, and a Master's degree in Applied Finance. Councillors, in investment attraction, there's a delicate balance between ensuring the desired outcome for Wodonga, that is attracting the right business, on commercial terms, while at the same time ensuring key risks are mitigated with a mind to both obvious risks and potential unintended consequences. To be clear, my motives and interests are aligned with what is best for Wodonga. I want to see economic growth, jobs and investment in Wodonga. What I do not support is selling half the remaining industrial land at Logic at an unprecedented low price of $5 per square metre. My primary concerns in relation to the proposed transaction are the impact of transact in transacting industrial land within Logic at $5 per square metre, the impact that will have on future sales at Logic, the impact of the rates received by Council at Logic with existing landlords likely to seek a reappraisal of the unimproved value component 
of their rates notices. The lack of disclosed remedies and safeguards built into the proposed transactions in the event the purchasers do not do what they are indicating. The potential reputation damage, reputational damage to Wodonga Council in transacting land at such a low price for land adjoining or in close proximity to major infrastructure. And lastly, the risk of jeopardising existing contracts at foot or options that are due to expire where land prices in these existing agreements are well above the stated $5 per square metre. Councillors, in considering this proposal, proposed transaction, I think it's really important to consider the founding rationale of logic. Logic was established as a cornerstone of Council's economic development strategy by the Council in 2003, and needs to, that needs to be considered. Logic Wodonga was established as an industrial state on the basis it was to be a multi-decade and potentially a multi-generational project. Council recognised that Logic had some key competitive advantages in terms of its strategic location to the Melbourne, Sydney and Canberra population catchments. In addition, the high quality connecting infrastructure, including the Hume Freeway, the Murray Valley Highway, and a major freeway interchange, plus the Melbourne Sydney Railway Line and now the Melbourne Brisbane Inland Rail Route provided logistical advantages. There was a recognition that Wodonga had run out of infill industrial land and that the next time Wodonga had a Visi or a Mars that would come along, that there would be no place for them to go given that we had run out of existing supply of industrial land. There was also a strong recognition that Wodonga's rate base was predominantly residential and that to grow this city and fulfil ratepayers' aspirations, the city needed to diversify its rate base by increasing its take of commercial rates. Logic was also seen as a means of using some of its sale proceeds towards contributing to city infrastructure as Logic became more developed and its intrinsic value was realised. Largely, Logic is currently achieving this, with Council having publicly stated that Logic brings in approximately $900,000 a year in rates and has also had land sales to date of over $23 million. In addition to this, Logic also aimed to achieve four key pillars. These four pillars aim to create the foundation infrastructure, services and businesses establishing Logic as an industrial state of critical mass. To, to date, all key pillars have been achieved. That is the anchor tenant being Woolworths, some ancillary tenants like Border Express, Exclam and Cope, the industry tertiary institution, TAFE, and the intermodal terminal, SCT. With the four pillars achieved and rate pays significant investment in logic to date, this is no time for a fire sale. The reasons for this submission is that I believe this proposed transaction is not in the rate payers' best interest, and that's because it's not commercial. It substantially lacks the necessary risk mitigation for what are clear risks in this transaction. It has the risks of creating several unintended consequences and it has failed to engage with important stakeholders impacted by this deal going ahead. I'm going to speak to why this proposed transaction fails the criteria of being in Wodonga's ratepayers' best interests. As I said before, the proposed transaction is not commercial. In my opinion, the proposed transaction at $5 per square metre represents a gross undervaluation of the land. All this land within Wodonga's municipality is zoned Industrial 1. It was purchased 17 years ago at a price of $2.50 per square metre as farmland. Farmland that, wasn't, that you know, had very, very basic infrastructure. Certainly none of the infrastructure that exists at Logic today. Since Council rezoned Logic land to industrial, it spent well over $30 million of ratepayers' money servicing it. It has successfully completed on a number of sales to different purchases. There have been significant numbers of transactions to demonstrate that Logic land has sold well above the price indicated in the public notice. In fact, 600 to 800% more than the um, for service land. These sales include, and I do have this for councillors um, in a printed form, also electronic form. In 2004, 25 hectares were sold to Woolworths at $40 a square metre. In 2005, four hectares were sold to Border Express, again at $40 a square metre. In 2006, 9.44 hectares 
to Paclib again at $40 a square metre. In 2007, 3.71 hectares to cope sensitive freight, again at $40 a square metre. 2008, 40 hectares were sold to TAFE at $10 a square metre in what was seen by Council at the time as a government-to-government -government transaction of unserviced land with agreements to prevent further subdivision of that TAFE land. There was also a requirement that TAFE service that land, which came at significant expense to TAFE. In 2011, 2.33 hectares was sold for the BP service centre, again at $40 a square metre. In 2018, just recently, two, a number of hectares, I think it was two hectares, was sold to Formula Forage at $30 per square metre, partly serviced with options to buy another eight hectares, also at $30 a square metre. There are also current options to purchase land with existing landowners, Formula Forage and SCT, at Logic, with prices well above the current stated $5 per square metre in the public notice. The sale to TAFE above shows that even where council sold land as unserviced, land in a government-to-government -government transaction in 2008, it was done at $10 per square metre, a level twice the current intended selling price in this public notice. Where there are variations to these prices, they are for exceptional reasons, which do not set a precedent for this transaction. An example of this is in 2015, where approximately 33 hectares of land was sold to SET for a price of 1.5 million. This transaction was made based on a comprehensive section 173 obligating the purchaser to build an $18 million intermodal rail terminal. This rail terminal was part of one of the key pillars of logic. The market for intermodal land is very much dictated by the limited number of intermodal rail operators in Australia. In fact, there are only three to four major players. Also in 2008, Council transacted a similar sized parcel of land immediately north of logic to facilitate the sale yards. This transaction was done 12 years ago in the depths of the GFC sold as rural one zone land not, industrial land, land, not industrial land, with minimal access to infrastructure for $4 a square metre. I've subsequently been informed that the land being optioned at $5 per square metre has been independently valued by PRP at or below $5 per square metre. I find this remarkable, as it was the same valuation company that valued the land at above $10 per square metre in the TAFE transaction in 2008. It should be noted that both pieces of land, a zone industrial one, are within logic and are both are not directly serviced by council in terms of the infrastructure. During this 12 year period, it is very improbable that industrial land prices in this region have halved. My request to council for information regarding the valuation with the land value redacted has not yet been forthcoming. I seriously question the underlying assumptions that have led to this very low proposed transaction price. I also strongly dispute that this land is unserviced. To be generous, I believe this is to be a, a technical term. In fact, some of the land being sold literally has road, power, sewer and water running directly past the land boundary. And I'll provide a map showing that. As mentioned previously, since Council purchased the land at Logic, it has spent circa $30 million of ratepayers' money bringing infrastructure to Logic. $30 million of infrastructure, including water, sewer, power, roundabouts, roads, and recently $5.7 million on a gas gate. This infrastructure has been brought from West Wodonga, where Vizzy is, eight kilometres down the Hume Freeway, all the way to Barnawatha North to service logic and the sites within it. The vast majority of this land being proposed to be optioned at $5 a square metre has either major utility infrastructure and roads going past it or within 400 metres of the site boundary. In my opinion, Council should not be investing $30 million of ratepayer money to be selling this land as unserviced land at $5 a square metre. This is commercial insanity. And if Council proceeds to agree to this transaction, it will create the single largest transfer of wealth from the ratepayers of Wodonga to a private purchaser in the history of this Council. Both the action of proposing to option or sell unserviced land is highly uncommercial 
an evaluation that underpins the proposed price is highly contestable. The proposed transaction substantially lacks the necessary risk mitigations. In reading the public notice, scant information is provided in relation to conditions that council is imposing on the purchaser to fulfil its commitments under the contract. The public notice refers to the purchasers procuring a planning permit for the re relevant sites. There is no reference to the scale and size required of both the solar farm and the foundry as part of the planning permits. Likewise, in the section 173 referenced in the public notice, there is no reference to the required scale of the development to satisfy practical completion. In previous transactions, councillors, namely the sale of land to SCT or the sale of land to Palisade, the purchaser entered into an agreement to the size, scale and design of their proposed developments. This proposed transaction is very open to the risk of council having no remedy in the event the purchaser does not fulfil its requirements under the Section 173 agreement. If there is such a remedy, whether it's performance bonds, penalty payments or a buyback clause, why isn't it referenced in the public notice? Given this proposed transaction is to sell 92.7 hectares of the remaining 197 hectares of industrial land in Logic, that's nearly half the remaining land at Logic that's not under existing contract or option, a ratepayer would be justified in expecting that the required safeguards were mentioned in this public notice. Mentioning any such safeguards or potential remedies is what would be expected of a council acting in the best interest of its ratepayers. I'm going to be speaking about risk mitigation through standard commercial due diligence on the purchases. In previous cases where councils proposed substantial transactions, councils conducted due diligence on the purchaser in terms of the capacity and capability of the purchaser to deliver on what it's promising to do. The due diligence on the purchaser has included the purchaser's track record to deliver the size of the project as well as its financial capacity not just to buy the land, but to deliver on the required project. This precedent includes, but is not limited to the sale of land at SCT for the intermodal terminal and Palisade for the sale yards, despite both companies having highly demonstrated track records and financial capability. My question is, has council performed this due diligence on the proposed purchases and would the standard commercial practice in a transaction of this significance being half of the remaining land at Logic? Councillors, I believe that this proposed transaction risks creating several unintended consequences. The pro proposed transaction at $5 a square metre for industrial zone land in such close proximity to services greatly risks likely material unintended consequences. The unintended consequences could include the proposed transaction at $5 per square metre, if implemented, will create a new unprecedented low transaction price for industrial land at Logic. The risk here is that the existing landlords at Logic who purchase land at $30 to $40 a square metre will seek a rates reappraisal of the unimproved land value component of their rates notice. This has a high risk of significantly reducing the rate intake at Logic by hundreds of thousands of, thousands of dollars per year, a reduction that will need to be worn by residential ratepayers for many years. The proposed transaction will create a strong price precedent and anchor future valuations and sales at Logic. Council would be extremely naive to think future sales, land sales, will be anything above $5 per square metre in the future. This risks undermining the original business case of Logic and poses financial risk to Council's own balance sheet valuation of land at Logic. Likewise, the intention of using Logic's sale proceeds towards future civic infrastructure is clearly undermined. Um, in, in the interest of, uh, of us all getting your very uh, passionate presentation and your submission, councillors, where we are a little over the 15 minutes, I'm just looking for the support for Mr Gable to be able to complete what he has prepared in front of us. I'm getting all nods. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr Gable. Please continue. Can you hear me? So, uh, council risks substantial, substantive reputational risk of selling the land at such materially lower prices than the previous transactions. Purchases of land at $30 to $40 a square metre will be questioning 
how and why land at such close proximity to all services can be sold at $5 a square metre. Currently, there are a number of contracts either at foot or under negotiation. These contracts include contracts for sale of land or options to buy land that were executed a number of years ago and are due to settle to be exercised, or to be exercised. This current proposed transaction has the potential to create a material risk of these contracts falling over or options expiring unexercised at the pre-agreed rates well above $5 a square metre. This may create a multi-million dollar loss to council, again at the expense of ratepayers. I'm going to speak quickly to how council has failed to adequately engage with important stakeholders impacted by this deal if it goes ahead. The Victorian State Government has provided clear guidance to councils regarding both best practice and legal requirements regarding council consultation relating to the proposed sale of land. Both the local government both Local Government Victoria and the Victorian Government Land Monitor in 2009 released the Local Government Best Practice Guidelines for the sale of and exchange of land. In conjunction with this, the Victorian State Government passed a new Local Government Act 2020 restricting the powers to sell or exchange land. Both the Best Practice Guidelines and the Old Government uh, Local Government Act and the new Local Government Act refer to Council's requirement to consult ratepayers and residents on the proposed sale of land. The current Local Government Act goes one step further in section 114.2b of the Act, stating Council must undertake a community engagement process in accordance with the, its community engagement policy. So what is Wodonga Council's policy on community engagement? Well, Council provides the community engagement policy on its website. Key community engagement principles are referred and referenced including being inclusive and accessible, timely and appropriate clear and responsive. Of particular interest was reference to the need to use the community engagement methods when there is a potential to impact potential neighbours or when proposed changes are intergenerational in nature or may impact the public good. No doubt the above three reasons would trigger the need for community engagement. The question I ask is does a public notice buried on page 78 in minuscule font constitute appropriate inclusive, clear and responsive engagement. Is this sufficient? A ratepayer understanding the inherent risks within this proposed transaction would expect a different form of consultation to that prescribed by the soon to be superseded section 189 of the Local Government Act and more akin to the recently enacted Local Government Act. So what is Council's own policy on this? On page 10 of this agenda item in 8.1 states in relation to Council's policies the strategic objective is to provide strong leadership and governance demonstrating excellence in the way we do business by being innovative, responsive and transparent. We will be accountable and, and steward the organisation with the highest regard. To me, good governance would be giving councillors adequate time to digest and robustly test the information and assumptions underlying this proposed transaction particularly with the nature and quantum of risk implicit in this transaction. The need for further time and due diligence is further compounded given the three, that three of the current seven councillors are new to their roles as councillors and understanding the critical role logic plays in Wodonga's economy and councils' finances. Likewise, transparency requires a much higher disclosure than a public notice scant on key terms and conditions and the necessary remedies to protect council in the event of non-performance by a purchaser. Council, councils, I'm aware of the time, and um, I don't. I'm going to provide this electronically to Officer Scully. Um, but just in closing, councillors, I, I believe there are some fundamental gaps in this proposed transaction. What confidence do you have as councillors that appropriate due diligence has been done on the purchases in terms of their track record and financial capability and capacity to do what they say they will? What safeguards does council have in its contracts of sale and section 173 providing remedy in the event the purchaser does not deliver on their development plans? Why has this not been disclosed or is it that these safeguards just don't exist? 
How does a price of $5 per square metre get negotiated in the context of previous sales at Logic, knowing the potential consequences of transacting at that price? How can council justify ratepayers spending ratepayers investing over $30 million to service land at Logic just to sell land adjoining that infrastructure as unserviced land? If creating a development with a strong renewable energy component was a driving factor in this proposal and getting this far, why didn't council put it out to an open expressions of interest? What confidence does council have that this transaction will not undermine the existing contracts and options already in place? Councillors, I don't know how this transaction, this proposed transaction got as far as it has with the inherent risks without disclosed remedies with such a poor precedent for future sales and undermining the rates at Logic, that it, how it ever got this far, I don't know. You are the custodians of this multi-generational project. The proposal in the public notice is just that. It's a proposal. The legislation requires council to be open-minded and having not predetermined this outcome. My request of you, councillors, is to do your research understand and challenge the assumptions behind the merits of this proposed transaction. Consider the risks and ask, is this in the best interest of Wodonga ratepayers? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And councillors, just noting that we were generous in extending that time. Did anybody have any questions or, or are we happy there at that point? Thank you again, Mr. Goble. Um, councillors, there is the officer recommendation on page seven of your agenda. Would somebody like to move that a motion? Thank you, Councillor Simfendorfer has moved the officer recommendation. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Uh, does anyone wish, wish to speak against the motion? Motion is carried unanimously. On to item 8.2, the appointment of an audit and risk committee independent member. Uh, there is a recommend the officer recommendation once again on page 34 or page 15 of the public agenda. Uh, would somebody like to move a motion? Thank you, Councillor Quilty. Uh, would somebody like to second? Uh, Councillor Quilty has moved the officer recommendation. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you, Councillor Quilty. Would you like to speak? Thank you. Uh, no, I don't have any comments here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. No comments. Uh, other councillors, would anybody like to speak? No one. Uh, so I put the motion. All those in favour? All opposed? Thank you muchly. Carried unanimously. 8.2 tonight, councillors, the recommendation from the officers is on page 44. Again, the public agenda, page 19. Um, this is about the park relocation, item 8.3. Would somebody like to move a motion? Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Councillor Bennett has moved the officer recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Watson. Uh, Councillor Bennett. So just to give a bit of background on this one, this was a park that we went out for consultation a little while ago around this name and then after that we actually found out that that park out at Kalara um, has Aboriginal cultural significance. So to honour that we have proposed that we will move that park name to a nearby location which I think is certainly the right thing to do. When we, um, so with this process it involves uh, consulting with the neighbouring um, communities around this change and there was two submitters back who raised concerns around the actual um, infrastructure at the park moving. Um, but we did reply to them saying it's just the name, all the infrastructure at the park will remain the same. So hopefully that deals with the submitters concerns. I think issues like this will keep emerging when we discover new um, information about Wodonga and what has Aboriginal cultural significance. Another uh, factor with this one is the family involved are, uh, are more than happy to have the, um, the park name relocated to another park. So I think everyone involved, it's a pretty um, satisfactory outcome. Thanks, Councillor Bennett. Councillor Watson? Uh, no, no questions, thank you. Uh, other councillors, anybody like to speak to the motion? 
no further comments, Councillor Bennett, thank you. Uh, therefore, I put the motion. All those in favour? All opposed, none. We're carrying that one unanimously. On to item 8.4, the fraud and corruption prevention management policy. A reminder, councillors, there is an officer recommendation on page 49 and it's page 24 of the public agenda. Would someone like to move a motion? Thank you, Councillor Quilty. Uh, Councillor Quilty has moved the officer recommendation. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Simfendorfer. Uh, Councillor Quilty. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like to say that it's a very good piece of policy that includes comprehensive definitions of both fraud and corruption. And um, I would like also to point out that, um, as we all know, there is uh, real fraud and corruption and there is perceived fraud and corruption. Uh, unfortunately, in the past, there has been some perception of uh, uh, some corruption in the community, and uh, it is my goal, and likewise, I believe it is the go goal of everybody uh, here to work, to endeavor that we get rid of this perception, and uh, I endeavor to make sure for, like speaking for myself, and I'm sure I express the opinion of everybody else, uh, I will endeavor to make sure that there is no perception of corruption left by the end of my term here. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Quilty. Councillor Simfendorfer. Uh, no, I'll just echo Councillor Quilty's comments that a, a comprehensive prevention and management policy in line with um, the policies and the relevant acts. So uh, I, yeah, I'm more than happy to, to have that seconded and, and note that it'll be reviewed within two years from, from once it's adopted. That's probably it. Yep. Other councillors? No. No further words, uh, Councillor Quilty, thank you very much. Uh, I put the motion, all those in favour? Thank you, carried unanimously once again on to item, item 8.5, the tender for the supply and delivery of three leased diesel powered tractors. Councillors, there is a officer recommendation on page 56, uh, it's page 31 of the public agenda. Would someone like to move a motion? Thank you, Councillor Mildred moves the officer recommendation. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Watson. You were first in this time around. Councillor Mildren. And no comment, Councillor Watson, any comment? It's very much an operational thing, uh, Mr Mayor, um, but, um, you know, to keep our assets uh, up to date, and um, this is just a great pr process that we go through. And uh, and also the way that they do the tender, tender process, it's, uh, it's good. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Any other councillors? No. Uh, I therefore put the motion. All those in favour? Thank you. Carried unanimously. On to item 8.6, the tender for the provision of fire and emergency service maintenances, um, maintenance, I should say. Councillors, the recommendations on page 61 for you, uh, page 36 of the public agenda. Would someone like to move a motion? Thank you, Councillor Simfendorfer. He's moved the officer recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Councillor Simfendorfer. I uh, know, Mr. Mayor, the report's self-explanatory and appropriate, so that's... No comment from Councillor Bennett. Uh, other councillors, no. I therefore put the motion. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. On to number eight point, item 8.7, the tender for the gallery library landscape construction works. The recommendation is on page 66 and uh, on page 41 of the public agenda. Would somebody like to move a motion? Councillor Watson has moved the officer recommendation. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Councillor Watson. Uh, Mr Mayor, um, Stuart Gordon Landscaping, that is the recommended specialist. Um, they've done some fantastic work in this city. Um, you know, I, I know it looks like that it, it appears that they, um, they always get the job, but the, through our tendering system, um, they always come up with the best quality and best return for dollar. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing the, um, the finish off pro pro project next year. So it'll be very good. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Councillor Bennett, nothing comments. Uh, other councillors? I uh, therefore put the motion. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thanks very much. 
On to item 8.8, .8, the tender for Barrandooda Fields plantation removal. The officer recommendation sits on 72, page 72 that is, or page 47 of the public agenda. Would somebody like to move a motion? Thank you, Councillor Mildred. Councillor Mildred has moved the officer recommendation. Do we have a seconder? Uh, thank you, Councillor Quilty. I think the hand went up first, so we'll go with Quilty. Uh, Councillor Mildred. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I have a bit of knowledge and background to some of the things that have happened with this plantation and how it came to pass. And it, it forms part of the original Albury Wodonga Development Corporation forward planting um, programs that in their time, they were originally put in place to create an opportunity to sculpt an urban environment, but with trees and things left remaining where they were appropriate and to remove the trees that weren't appropriate. And in the case of this particular piece of land, we're developing a very significant piece of um, infrastructure for the future um, Barrandoodle and Eva growth area. And it is appropriate to sculpt these trees in the manner proposed to ensure that we can provide those um, services and facilities in the recreation area. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mildren, for a little bit of history there on that. Uh, Councillor Quilty. Uh, yes, please. I suppose I have a little um, question without notice here. Um, the report says that um, the council uh, won't be able to make profit from selling this timber. So what I think we should discuss for the benefit of the public, um, whether it is the, the proposed usage of the timber harvested is going to be in the uh, best interest of the uh, ratepayers, the most economic use of it, and um, um, maybe a short history as to, or short information as to why uh, we're unable to make profit from uh, selling this timber, and also um, maybe a little bit of assurance that the possible ongoing cost or oh, if there is any ongoing cost of uh, uh, storing timber, maybe it's sitting in the open, it being uh, open to any weather, um, possible rotting, or whether um, there might be any ongoing cost to that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Quilty. Uh, Simone Hogg, Director of Community Development. Uh, can you help our question there? I can answer um, in part of, of that question, um, which is the timber is intended to be reused for a range of council purposes. So actually, um, it's an amazing opportunity to have this stock available. Um, so please be assured that it will be repurposed for council purposes, including public spaces, playgrounds, nature play, etc. In regards to the storage of that, um, I, if we can take that question on notice, I can respond. Thank you very much, Simone Hodder. Hog, Director of Community Development. Um, councillors, uh, any further comments on that? Uh, back to Councillor Mildren. No, I therefore put the motion. All those in favour? Thank you. Carried unanimously for item 8.8. .8. On to item 8.9, the tender for the supply and installation of sports lighting to Kelly Park soccer fields and also Birley Park football oval. Councillors, there is an officer recommendation, page 101 for you or page 75 of the public agenda. Would somebody like to move a motion? Councillor Benner has moved the officer recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Simfendorfer. Councillor Bennett. Uh, so this is around the tender and supply of um, LED lighting at Kelly Park Soccer Fields and Beerley Park Football Field, which has a lot of advantages, obviously environmental, and it's better for maintenance. It's also controlled remotely, so it will be um, much more efficient for all those sporting volunteers who have limited hours, so they'll be able to um, manage that remotely, which will be good for them. Thank you. Councillor Simpendorfer. Only one other thing to add, I think, to, to that was, I think, the addition to a netball court that's um, in that proposal as well, so that's an extra benefit to the LED lighting. That's, thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillors, any further commentary? No, thank you. I therefore put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Item 8.10, the donation request for the City to City 2021. Councillors, there's an officer recommendation on page 109 for you, page 83 of the public agenda. Would somebody like to move a motion? Thank you, Councillor Quilty. Councillor Quilty has moved the officer recommendation. Is there a seconder? 
Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Uh, Councillor Quilty. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to speak in the support of the recommendation to decline the monetary donation and to support the event with advocacy and advice. I believe that city to city is a great cause, and I have no doubt that all of us present and uh, um, a lot of people in the public who can afford it will be more than happy to chip in a little bit. However, here as council, we are dealing with ratepayers' money, and we should be very cautious in handling ratepayers' money. And uh, I think um, ratepayers will be better placed to donate if they wish to do so out of pocket rather than us mm, donating uh, money that's not essentially ours, that's the city's. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Quilty. Councillor Bennett. Um, I'll just add to Councillor Quilty's comments as well um, and say that this will bring us in line with uh, how Aubrey supports the event as well. and. Absolutely, both councils think this is a fantastic event. I've participated in the event every year, and I say participated because I certainly haven't run, but I have participated in the event. Um, and the advocacy and support is still a really big role and does come with a financial cost to council in terms of the time that it takes to do this. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Other councillors? Uh, Councillor Simpendorfer. Just wish you well, Mr Mayor, and your training for the event. <laughs> And uh, I'll be, be there watching with great interest. There you go. Thank you. So there are other ways that we can... Oh, Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I, I believe totally in, in uh, the city to city and, and our policies and procedures where we have requested donations and after a couple of years um, that they, you know, should um, hold their own. Um, we are doing in kind, and I understand that, but this is an incredible year of, of stress and strain on the health community, our communities. And, um, you know, I would like to think that we could put the $3,000 forward, and I'll be speaking again, I'll be voting against the motion, only for it, not because of the policy, I believe in the policy, I believe in all that, but it's just one organisation that has been under complete stress this year. Um, and, you know, if we could help them a little bit more so they can get more dollars in to support our hospital assets, but um, but I agree what the policy is there for and why we have it, but this is an unusual year. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Any other councillors? I put the motion all in favour. All opposed? Thank you, John. Our motion is carried. Uh, on to item 8.11, which is the Birralee Park Outdoor Cricket Net Redevelopment Project, uh, of which you find on page 115, uh, Officer Recommendation, uh, page 89 of the public agenda. Uh, would someone like to move a motion? Thank you, Councillor Simfendorfer has moved the Officer Recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Mildren. Councillor Simfendorfer. Um, no, I note that um, the recommendation is three parts with a subsequent options at part A and B at the, at the um, end of that recommendation in that if funding is secured through the local roads community infrastructure program, there's a set amount of 137,500 um, and 227,500 if, if that's not achieved. Um, so I just want to make that clear that there's those three subjects of that recommendation of injection of funds from Cricket Albury Wodonga, Albury City Council and Australian Cricket, and that those two options A and B at the end. Thank you, Councillor Simfendorfer. Councillor Mildred. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, cricket in Albury Wodonga particularly, but nationally is one of the biggest um, games of participation um, at young people, very young children right through to uh, as we have here in Wodonga, a team that's got people in their 70s playing cricket. Uh, it's really important in my view that we continue to grow the assets locally for cricket and this will contribute to that. Um, it's also very important to note that this facility, that, or that this is an addition to a facility that is of some national um, standard and, it's, and it provides opportunity for us to have elite cricketers growing and, and developed here within our own community. So to put the amounts of um, money that we've jointly put in between the various levels of government, both Albury City and ourselves, is in the big picture a relatively small contribution to what we will generate out of this, both for the current generations and those well into the future. 
And I think um, the work that's being done on this and that's being done by uh, Cricket Albury Wodonga to promote this is extraordinary and we should be thanking those people from the community that are contributing to all this. Um, I won't name names because I'll miss somebody out. Um, but there are a lot of people that are doing a lot of very good work to make this stuff happen and this is the least we can do to make it work. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Miltron. Any, uh, thank you, Watson. Well, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I think um, there's two sides to this and I back uh, Councillor Miltron's comments 100% there, is that um, we could have a centre of excellence here for cricket and all year round, which um, is fantastic. I can see uh, young cricketers or older cricketers relocating to Albury Donga, knowing that we have the, these resources here. So I think to put us on the map with um, with cricket and developing young people into sport is just an amazing thing. And I think the most important thing is when we do projects to complete them, and this is to completely complete them. Thank you, Councillor Watson and Councillor Quilty. You yeah. Yes, please, thank you. Uh, firstly, I would like to back the um, previous council's comments and uh, I would also like to quickly use this opportunity to emphasize um, um, how cautious, um, sorry for being devil's advocate all the time, uh, how cautious we should be as councillors when endeavoring on big projects in case the um, government funding uh, that we're counting on fails and uh, um, in case um, not with relevance to this project but uh, uh, just any uh, any other larger projects that we um, endeavor on, um, we should always be careful in case uh, the uh, government funding we count on fails and uh, we need to come to rate payers. So, yeah, I think we should endeavour to exercise uh, that caution. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Quilty. Uh, other councillors wanting to speak? Just before I put the motion, I will invite the CEO um, to give us an update on that uh, funding uh, request that's in there and where that fund does come from. Uh, thank you, CEO. Mr Mayor, thank you for that opportunity. And, and it is highlighted in the uh, paper that um, Council is hopeful of receiving the additional funding from the local roads and community infrastructure program. Um, I would say that our confidence in that is very high in the sense that we've already got the guidelines and we've already submitted this as part of our solution to that fund. Uh, we just haven't yet been able to sign and finalise that funding agreement. So in wanting to be as transparent as we can with our community, uh, the worst case scenario is that we're seeking an extra $90,000 we are very confident that that funding will come out of the local roads and community infrastructure program. We should have that confirmed before Christmas, but um, what we've painted is the worst case scenario. Um, it's, we think it's very, very likely the Commonwealth will fund that through that program. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. Um, councillors, I'll now put the motion. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, on to item 8.12, the Wodonga Planning Scheme Amendment C133, the anomalies and corrections. Councillors, the recommendations on page 120 and uh, then page 95 of the public agenda. Um, would somebody like to move a motion? Thank you, uh, Councillor Mildren. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to move an alternate motion. Um, I'd like to move that in accordance with section 29 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987, the Council adopts Amendment C133 with the exception of all components associated with the land at Lot 1, uh, Title Plan 157764 or otherwise known as 47 Jarrah Street, Wodonga. Um, application point number two, application be made to the Minister for Planning for authorisation to prepare a formal planning scheme amendment to rezone the portion of land being Lot 1, Title Plan 157764 47 Jarrah Street, Wodonga, to an appropriate alternative zone, given its flooding designation, and that the amendment process include full public notice to affected adjoining and adjacent landowners. Point number three, the adopted amendment be submitted to the Minister for Planning in accordance with section 31 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987, and the Minister for Planning be requested to formally approve amendment C133 in accordance with section 35 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987. Thank you, Councillor Mildred. Um, do we have a seconder for the alternative motion? Thank you, uh, Councillor Hall. 
Councillor Mildren, you've obviously spoken to that. Councillor uh, Hall, um, oh, sorry, Councillor Mildren, go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there's a whole range of things that, that relate to the property at 47 Jarrah Street that jump out, and, and we could talk about a lot of them, but I'll, I'll try and get straight to the point. The, there's two basic fundamental issues at 47 Jarrah Street. Um, the first one is, given recognition that the land in question is subject to flooding and is covered by the floodway overlay, it's, I believe it's inappropriate that it be designated suitable for residential use and development by inclusion in the general residential zone. That's the first point. And, and that's, that's the proposal that this amendment's putting up. The second point is, um, if it were appropriate to put it in the general residential zone, then should such a rezoning which changes the potential development capability of the land be made without notice to abutting landowners? Um, in other words, this is more than just a simple anomaly in my view. This is, this is potentially having impact um, on adjoining landowners that they currently don't um, have. I say potentially because all of these things are subject to permit processes and everything else, but the potential, once we change this zone to general residential zone, um, we could be put in a position where development could be occurring that, that would not be something that would be expected by the residents across the fence. So I'm suggesting um, that the current zoning, I recognise that the current zoning as public park and recreation zone of private land is entirely inappropriate. Um, and for a whole range of reasons, we. Um, should be changing that, and that's why I've, I've suggested in my motion that um, you know we, we apply to the minister to change it, but we go through the proper formal processes so everybody gets a say. Um, in, in, in essence, I think this is the transparent way to deal with this. It, it solves what's been identified as an anomalous situation, and that the anomalous situation is the fact that it's inappropriately zoned. Um, the solution that we've put up to it is the bit that I don't consider to be an anomaly. So therefore the motion is um, the way I've worded it. So I think we'll leave it at that for the time being. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Mildred. Councillor Hall. Uh, yes, um, okay. Look, we've been told by council officers that these planning anomalies don't require changes to the, um, these planning anomalies require uh, that require, they don't um, need sorry, um, the change to the zone don't need public exhibition. And, and that may be the case, but as a council, we can choose to decide to take a decision and publicly notify the affected landowners and adjoining landowners uh, to the change of the planning scheme amendment that could impact them just for transparency reasons. Um, uh, just to be, uh, uh, you know, just to inform people, I think um, if the shoe was on the other foot, and it was happening to yourself, I think you would like to be made aware of these changes that would be um, going on around you. With, it, with Not everyone goes onto the Council website and um, looks at our uh, agendas or our minute, Council minutes. So without notifying these people, they're not aware, they, they won't be aware that this is even happening until it's happened. And I think uh, just to do the right thing, transparency-wise, I think um, we should uh, pull this out and uh, and deal with it differently. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hall. Um, other councillors? Uh, Councillor Bennett. Yeah, I've just got a question around maybe um, Officer Schultz might be able to answer. Can you just explain exactly why we were given exemption not to um, notify the abutting landowners? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor, the amendment is widespread. Um, it, it, it impacts a, a range of properties and property owners across the whole of the city. This isn't just about Jarrah Street. There are potentially thousands of other notifications that would have been required um, had full public notification gone out. So that was one of the reasons. 
The other reason was that, um, according to the officers and the officers' approach to the municipal planning or his department, was that these are really just putting in place what is actually happening on the ground. Um, these have very little, arguably with the exception of Jarrah Street, I'm not quite sure I'm getting the feedback, all, all the anomalies correction is, is doing, amendment is doing, it's just regularizing, if I may use that word, what is on the ground and are, are of no material impact on the resident, the community, etc. That's the general reasoning behind the exemption that was granted, asked for and granted by the, by the Minister's Department. Thank you, Leon Schultz, uh, Director of Planning and Infrastructure. Councillors, any further? Councillor Watson. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. And as I as an apology at this morning's briefing, and I'm sure you discussed it a little bit more at that, that time. Um, and, I, and it's really a question to Officer Schultz is that um, because the, 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 the former officer's report was to adjust, just to adjust anomalies and corrections of, of the planning scheme, um, the new motion from Councillor Mildred, will that change much for the whole organisation? For you, Mr Mayor. Um, Councillor Watson, no. Um, the, um, the proposed change to the, to the amendment or to the re recommendation um, won't change what's on the ground. What's on the ground has been there since probably pre-1999. Um, there will be no impact. There will be no material impact on on the property owner or the residents surrounding. Um, but if the motion is carried, then we will commence a formal process of uh, investigating an alternate zone and um, seeking authorisation through a number of council meetings, through to um, the minister in due course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Milton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, these things, the processes and things that go with all these sorts of amendments um, are not always as clear cut as they seem. Um, when, as um, Officer Schultz said, when we do um, anomalous amendments or to planning schemes to deal with anomalies, there are usually um, very large numbers of different, quite disparate places um, that get impacted. And, and they often are simple things like a metre or two adjustment in a plan of subdivision versus what the planning scheme has said. Because when you get to the fine detail of things, you, you get all sorts of different adjustments that need to be made. And, and fundamentally, that's the purpose for anomalous amendments. Um, how this one sort of slipped through the net is a little surprising to me, but I understand when you've got lots and lots and lots of them, um, these things can happen. In terms of what the Department of Planning um, does in giving notice, they don't get down into the fine detail whenever they look at these things at the point of authorising um, the exemption. Because let's be honest, they're dealing with, if we're talking about the Hume region, they're dealing with, I think it's 10 or 11 different councils over something like um, maybe 30 or 35 per cent of this area of the state. Um, and I would suspect there's probably hundreds of amendments that they need to deal with every year. So they simply wouldn't be able to go down and look at every component of every um, anomalous um, amendment to make sure that it actually is an anomaly. So they have to take the, the council. The, the council has a responsibility as the planning authority to do that and make sure that they get that right. Now, sometimes we're, we're not perfect, it's, you know, things happen. But um, they, they accept what the council puts in generally in terms of that detail. I'm talking very general about this stuff. So that's how we get um, exemptions given and we find ourselves in this sort of circumstance. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not a significant problem, it's just something that happens in the process and the way it works and occasionally things get a bit you know, skew with. Um, so, basically, I just I think we're doing the right thing by our community um, by by taking this component out and putting it through a proper public process. And I think the, all the other matters that are in it um, seem to be perfectly acceptable, and we should deal with those 
um, as of um, put in the motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mildred, and um, obviously you've outlined the alternative motion there. Um, so I will put that motion and all those in favour? All opposed? Thank you, motion is carried. Uh, on to item 8.13, the access to the waste management reserve. Councillors, the recommendation, the officer recommendations on page 160 or page 135 of the public agenda. Uh, would someone like to move a motion? Thank you. Councillor Quilty has moved the officer recommendation. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Hall. Councillor Quilty. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to draw the public's attention to the um, um, amount of the reserve surplus that we have in the information uh, to the recommendation. It's 523,000. And uh, I would just like to make it extra clear that we are not discussing the um, amount of this reserve. Um, this um, is to talk about uh, taking an amount of money out of the reserve for um, building the shed. But uh, I believe that uh, um, somewhere down the track in uh, budgeting, we need to have a look at the uh, size and of this uh, reserve and uh, perhaps set the maximum reserve that we should have for the future and look at ways of uh, uh, dealing with it if it um, gets above the maximum, such as uh, refunding it to ratepayers. But uh, again, this is outside the scope of today's vote. Today we vote on uh, accessing this reserve to uh, meet the requirements for the chemical shed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Quilty. Councillor Hall? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to add a little bit further, just sort of a little bit of the history. I think most people probably are aware, but I will just go into it anyway. Um, the Ombudsman report stated back in 2018 that the charges to the ratepayers for the waste management levy were to be res a reasonable reflection of the charges and the costs that were reflected to cancel. Um, as these costs can sometimes be hard to estimate when doing our budgets, there will be at times surpluses, surpluses but even maybe, hopefully, not um, blowouts. Uh, during our last council tenure, uh, we decided that any extra uh, money received or saved from the waste manage management levy be separated and put aside as a reserve for the for waste management costs uh, going forward. Um, so when we go into budget discussions, councillors can decide whether we keep this amount in total or impartial uh, for any purpose for equipment, works, infrastructure needed to service our commitments in implementing waste services to the community. Um, or that that money could come off our uh, levy to the ratepayers in the following year's assessment. Um, in the report in front of us tonight, there is a requirement by the EPA for Council to provide an adequate chemical storage facility at our waste transfer station that meets the EPA regulations. Uh, the amount is for 70,000. Uh, we have a reserve of 523,000, more than enough to cover this. And at our next budget discussions, any leftover amount will be decided upon uh, during the budget process. So um, it's mainly tonight is it's about the $70,000 spend on um, the chemical storage facilities at our waste station. Um, and I, it's a needed um, requirement that we uh, we build this, uh, this structure for our waste service for uh, people who uh, we get piles of chemicals, paints, all sorts of stuff. So we need a, an appropriate um, place to uh, store it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hall. Uh, any other councillors seeking to make comment? Councillor Watson. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I think what we've got to really look at here is the recommendation is for a new chemical storage shed and with EPA regulations and with uh, with with terrible, uh, well, not terrible, but within our community, we have a lot of chemicals that are not great for our environment. And um, often, when a a, um, a, a um, house is sold up for in a probate or whatever uh, reason, that, and people are clearing out their garage sheds, I think that's what I should really get to is when they're clearing out their garage sheds, they're not dumping their, the 
the chemical soda to have a, an area where it's contained uh, fumes and all sorts of things. Uh, the storage shed is most important for our community. Um, and I'd always prefer to have a bit of a reserve than have a deficit where we have to top it up and uh, we'd always then be calling on the community. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Other councillors? Uh, Councillor Milton. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, it's timely, I guess, that we do deal with this because the EPA have brought to our attention that we um, have inadequate facilities to deal with the chemicals. And um, having this reserve is um, prudent and it's, it's a mechanism that we can use to deal with these sorts of issues as they arise. And I think our policy that we've got in place in terms of using um, monies um, from the uh, waste management levy um, is, is a good policy. And I think this is an appropriate use of that money. Uh, I think all, all the things that we've put in place since the Ombudsman's report are um, quite good mechanisms to ensure that we don't do the wrong thing. The only thing that I find that's a little bit um, of a signal or a little flag to me is half a million dollars is starting to get to be a fairly high amount of money. I know if you look at it in terms of um, the percentage of the overall take or the or amount of dollars per assessment, it's probably not a huge amount. But when you look at it as a global term and in the context of the Ombudsman's report, I think we need to have a very good hard look at how this is working and go back to the basics in the budget processes. Um, but in terms of this particular project, this is perfectly acceptable and warranted for all the reasons I've spoken about. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mildred. Councillor Bennett? Yeah, just a few points. Um, as other councillors um, noted that this is completely in line with what we should be spending the money on, one of the Ombudsman's points was that um, surplus from the waste management levy was being spent on other things not to do with waste. So this completely ticks um, that box. In terms of I know it is a bit confusing and Councillor Hall alluded to this in terms of it is difficult to forecast what um, the surplus or, you know, hopefully not, but a deficit would be. And that's because the information that we uh, calculate this on is two years old. So and as we all know with waste, a lot can change in two years and a lot of it is it down to um, individual and I guess organisation behaviour. There's lots of work happening in our community around reducing waste. Hard, hard waste is doing fantastic work. So we would be hopefully expecting to see, you know, less in our bins. But with this year, with so many people working from home, um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, and we won't get that information for another two years time. So we've really got to make these decisions thinking about uh, the long term here. Uh, Another point in this report is where um, I think be, because this is a you know a really public issue, it s says every year we will be saying exactly where our reserve is being spent, and that'll be in our financial statements. But sometimes you know not everyone's going to go through financial statements, and we did have a discussion at briefing around how else can we make sure we get this information out about exactly how it is spent because it is now you know an issue that community do really want to have as much information as possible about. So hopefully we'll be able to work on some ways to not just in the financial statements, but elsewhere uh, show community where that money is being spent and that it is being spent on waste management as opposed to other things. Thanks, Councillor Bennett. Councillor Simpendorf, the only one not to speak so far on this one. Are you, you're right. All right. Um, Councillor Quilty. I don't have any further comments. I believe um, any um, points that I was um, looking at and uh, questions in, in the briefing have been adequately addressed here by uh, myself and other councillors. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Quilty. I therefore put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Uh, item nine uh, is reports for noting, of which there are none. Um, and once again, as we did last meeting, councillors, I'm going to go through the items in item 10. Please pull me up if you need to uh, speak to any of these reports. 10.1, the finance report for November 2020, uh, page 171 in our papers or 147 to the public agenda. 10.2, uh, uh, planning report for November 2020, 183 on ours or, oh, yes, Councillor Quilty. 
Uh, just a, a very quick stop here. I just uh, would like to point out that in the finance report at the bottom of the balance sheet, we have the line that says reserves uh, to 29 million, and that's the home to waste uh, management reserve. It, uh, several reserves are bundled here, and there is a little note that one of the reserves that a developer contribution reserve has been uh, uh, was incorrectly in the past um, bundled with accumulated surplus, but now that has been rectified and it sits in the reserves. Uh, so at the moment we just see this uh, bundle of uh, this big amount, but um, in the uh, financial statements and um, uh, the uh, budget there will be a proper note as required by financial standards to um, itemize what's in the reserve, but just pointing out that this is uh, the home to uh, the waste management reserve that uh, has been discussed. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Quilty. So 10.2, uh, as I said, was the planning report for November, 183, 159. 10.3, uh, the building report for November. 2020, 186 or 162 for the public agenda. 10.4, the competitive services report for November 2020, 191 was the page for us or 167 in public. Uh, the audit committee uh, meeting from September 16, uh, 2020, a summary of minutes there on page 194. Uh, 10.6, the record of councillor meetings on page 204 for us or 180 for public agenda. And the decisions register on 208 for us, 10.7. Yes, Councillor Bennett. Um, so just on the decisions register page uh, 211, uh, there's one around the Wodonga Hill strategy, which has a few resolutions in it. Um, I did just wonder, I know so a, a, a project update is going to happen. Um, I, I still just get so many community asking where this is up to. So we just wanted to know exactly when community will, uh, when will this information be public for community? Uh, Leon Schultz, Director of Planning and Infrastructure. So, Councillor, the through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the climb track um, has been completed and put in, into use. Um, we are still awaiting the final CHMP reports for additional works on the flats of McFarlane's Hill. Um, that will enable us then to determine the suitability of a car park or and a potential public toilets in that location and exactly where they will be placed. The COVID situation has um, severely impacted on the works, on-site works to be carried out, um, but we continue to work through that process with our consultants um, and hopefully um, we'll have a resolution to that pretty soon, but we are really just waiting for the CHMP, the Cultural Heritage Management Plan outputs before we make a final decision uh, on the location and extent of the proposed car park. Thank you, Leon. Council Bennett, all good. Uh, item 11 is notices of motion, of which there are none. Item 12, the petitions, which there are none. Uh, the common seal in item 13, also none. Item 14, general business. Councillors, any general business? Anybody that would like to fire away? No? Ah, I might throw some in if I can, though. Um, I'd love to acknowledge, um, I guess, the strain that a lot of our uh, City of Wodonga residents will have gone through over the past 24, 48 hours and will continue to go through um, as we lead up so closely to Christmas. I'd like to also uh, take this opportunity to recognise uh, the efforts of our community as a whole throughout this entire year, of which I know for each and every person is felt completely independently. Um, and whilst there is some unity, um, I'm hoping for everybody's sake that we will be able to have a Merry Christmas in the coming days by the end of this week. Um, today, uh, once again, I know it's been more so trying for, for many people, um, but I sincerely say that if there is a community that can rise to the challenge and can show resilience and support each other, it is one that we have the pleasure of representing as councillors. Um, so that being said, um, we'll move on to item number 15, urgent business, of which there is none. Uh, questions? Uh, CEO, I believe we have a question. Mr Mayor and councillors, thank you. We do have a, a question from a member of our community, Mr Robert Fleming. I'll read the question and then I'll also uh, give an immediate answer, but we will contact Mr Fleming with a written copy of the answer as well. 
The question is that uh, from Mr Fleming, I would like to find out what the new council is planning to do about the IMIX situation in Kalara. Their bid to build an extension to their plant on 94 Whites Road, which, which was rejected by the previous council and has been appealed by IMIX. That the hearing is being held in Melbourne in March and not here is not very acceptable and will entail some of the residents going all the way down there and staying for up to seven days of that hearing at their own expense. So in answer to that question, um, the planning permit application to amend the current IMIX permit was not supported by the Environment, Environment Protection Authority, the EPA, and was subsequently refused under delegation by council officers. This was appealed by the applicant, IMIX, with a VCAT compulsory conference already taking place via Zoom on the 27th of October 2020. This was a lengthy conference that was attended by Council's senior planning staff who were assisted by Council's legal representatives. The EPA, as well as JMP Developments and members of the Riverside Estate all attended the conference. The applicant was also represented. The negotiated proposal from that conference will be presented in an officer's report at the 25th of January 2021 Council meetings for a decision by Council. Regarding the proposed VCAT hearing in March 2021, should it proceed, it is a matter for VCAT to determine where and how these are managed. But as we've seen in the past, this could well take place in Wodonga or via Zoom or something similar. Um, the attendance is at the objector's expense as Mr. Fleming has pointed out. But I hope that um, should it proceed, um, the idea of Zoom at the moment is probably a good option for that to take place. There was a second question in terms of, does the council intend to send anybody down to contest this matter? And the simple answer is that um, we would always do that. And, and if that VCAT compulsory conference goes ahead, um, then, of course, council would be represented at that VCAT hearing, whether it was uh, in Melbourne or done remotely by Zoom or held in Wodonga. Okay, uh, I think that answers the question, and um, obviously, if Mr Fleming has any further details, we'll discuss those with him. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. Um, there's no confidential business or confidential urgent business, which leaves me to close this meeting. The next meeting will be on... Uh, Monday the 25th of January at 6pm. I'd like to acknowledge the councillors that have come in festive cheer this evening and may you all have a Merry Christmas and thanks to also the staff within the City of Wodonga. Thank you. Meeting closed. <laughs>